today on the 700 Club Canada. Emerging adulthood is uh, a period before people form their identities, and identities are formed when people negotiate roles in communities, and this is very important. The very big plank in their identity formation that people are looking for is career, and that's become harder and harder for people to target as they need more education, as they try to figure out what they're going to do. Welcome to the 700 Club Canada, I'm Brian Warren. And I'm Lori Hartshorn. And we're so excited that you have chosen to join us today. Did you know that most people can identify with going to church when they are young, but maybe it was a grandmother who took them? But often by adulthood, that changes. According to research, only one in three Canadian adults who attended church weekly as a child still do so today. Mm. And another sobering fact is that of the young adults who no longer attend church, half have also stopped identifying themselves with the Christian tradition in which they were raised. You know, this is so true, isn't it, Brian? I've mm -hmm. lived through a season of kids in these younger years and all the things competing for their attention from mm. the time they're a teen right up to their 30s. Yes. You know? You, you know, I've seen that as a pastor that there have been uh, shifts where Usually it's 18 to 35, but now it's even younger because by the time they get out of middle school and they go to high school, 14 and, and 15, now they have a lot of things competing with their time. That's and right. I find because of social media and a yeah. lot of other things, yeah. we, we have different influences that begin to start Absolutely. coming into their lives. Absolutely. The church has a lot of work to pay attention to this, for it sure. It really does. And we're joined today by Rick Heemstra from the Evangelical Fellowship of Canada to discuss this important issue. Now, here's, he'll share some research during our In Focus a bit later in the program. And we also have a powerful story of one young man who left the church when he became fascinated with New Age religion, mm. but Steve shares what brought him back. And a Christian couple living in Hollywood share how they were able to avoid temptation by committing to their faith. But first... The prodigal son comes home after a wild ride. I can't wait. I believed that I was God and that we could all become Christ too, if only we realized this inherent connection we have to, to God. At 19 years old, New Age blogger Steve Bancars was a spiritual guru to hundreds of thousands of followers. For Steve, it had spiritual and financial benefits. I was getting 200,000 to 300,000 views on it a day. And the income to me was an affirmation from God. I believe God was rewarding me with helping wake people up into a higher state of consciousness. It gave me a sense of power, a sense of purpose, and a sense of meaning and value perhaps. Steve grew up in a Christian home, but as a teenager developed a fascination for aliens, the paranormal, and psychic phenomenon. That led him to question his parents' Christian beliefs and eventually led to a full-blown obsession with New Age theology. The first thing that really got me doubting the biblical worldview was uh, UFOlogy. All of these UFO sightings, um, evidence from the ancient world that we might have been visited, and there was enough evidence to make me consider that maybe the universe is filled with intelligent biological life that was perhaps naturally evolved. If you piece together the alleged evidence for reincarnation and the alleged evidence for, um, you know, ancient astronaut theory. You get, um, you get New Age theology. Jesus remained part of Steve's worldview. I didn't really reject him, but I didn't accept him for who he truly was. I created an idol out of Jesus to suit my own preferences, to suit myself and to suit my sin. This Jesus was politically correct. He was a universalist. I wanted to be my own guide, and I didn't want to have to play by somebody else's rules. As Steve began blogging about New Age practices and supernatural phenomena, he came to enjoy his prominence and the money and vices that came with it. But it was never enough. I was a lust addict for 10 years or so. I was a really broken person. I didn't realize how broken that I, I truly was, but I was depraved. I was miserable. I had depression and anxiety that I was suppressing. I had all of this quote-unquote spiritual knowledge, 
all of this information and it wasn't bearing any real fruit in my life. I felt like something was missing. I felt a little bit dead inside. Steve had a disturbing dream. When I opened my eyes, I was hovering four feet over my bed and realized that I was out of my body and I started having a panic attack and a being appeared in front of me and this being had red skin with black markings on his face. It just scared me because I realized that I wasn't in control, that this stuff is more powerful than I was, that these forces were real and that they didn't care for my well-being. They didn't need my permission. I was in their playground. Shaken by the experience, he began investigating the claims of the Bible and Jesus more closely. I would sleep with the Bible under my pillow because I knew there was something there that was authoritative, that was true, and that was secure, and that had power over anything that I was scared of. In his search for answers, Steve was drawn to stories in books and online of people who had encounters with Christ. I would watch another near-death experience where someone would go to hell. Jesus would rescue them out of hell and they'd come back and the fruit of their lives, they would be totally transformed and I'd feel moved and touched. And I'd think to myself, okay, there's something real to Jesus, the Jesus of the Bible. Steve finally accepted one of his mother's many invitations to go with her to church. At the end of the service, he prayed and asked Jesus into his life, but it was more of a mental exercise than an act of faith. I just decided in my head intellectually that I was going to soften up to him, but I still held all the same New Age beliefs. I still believed in everything that I believed in my sin life. I wanted a little bit more of him, but I guess I still didn't want all of him. After a few days, Steve realized he couldn't ignore the truth any longer. I reached a point in my life where the brokenness was weighing on me so much that I, I needed to stop playing games with my life. I needed to stop playing games with God and stop playing games with Jesus. And I just decided to go outside and to just fall on my face before Jesus and just weep. I was just weeping like a baby. I was submitting. I was repenting. I was tired. I was sorry. I was broken and I couldn't do this alone anymore. And I was crying out for, for him. I wanted him. In that moment, Steve had an experience with Christ of his own. I could feel that he was Lord over me and he was Lord over all creation. I could feel that he was concerned for me, but I could feel that he was king. I knew that he was king over creation, that the whole universe was under his feet and the wind was just totally infused with his presence. And the thing that stuck out for me that made me realize that I was dealing with, with God was how the wind and the trees, this, the sounds outside the birds, the crickets, they sounded like they were glorifying him. Like he was, he was there with me and they were acknowledging that somehow. Like, creation recognized him. Steve burned all of his New Age books and made a public statement to his online followers. I told people within a few days of that experience, I'm sorry for misleading all of you astray. This stuff is not of God. They're tools of demons to deceive us and lead us away from Jesus. And Jesus is the Son of God and he's exactly who he claimed to be. Steve endured waves of ridicule and personal attacks from the online community, but that hasn't stopped him from trying to teach those who persecuted him. His website, reasonsforjesus.com, provides evidence and sound reasoning that prove the claims of the Bible and the only path to truth, forgiveness, and joy in life come through Jesus Christ. He delivered me from the stronghold of New Ageism and of occult philosophy. I'm the happiest I've ever been in my life. I feel more whole than I've ever been in my life. If there's hope for me, there's hope for anybody. I was the most lost person that I knew, and the Lord drew me to himself and had mercy on me. We come to the Lord. He forgives us. He gives us his spirit, and he wants to help us 
heal and restore us and walk us through these traumas and these pains. And he wants to accept us and welcome us as a son into relationship with him, not into dry religious rule keeping, but into a supernatural intimate relationship with Jesus Christ and his presence. You know, that is so fascinating because that has a lot of bearing on Canada today. I rule my world and I rule it perfectly. That's right. really the new age. Anything that's beyond the cross. That's right. And you know, I what I astounds me, he's 22 years old. Yes. And he's running this massive 200, internet. 300,000, yeah. But you know what we see, I love how Jesus goes after people, Brian. Yes. Because in all of his intellectualism, mm -hmm. I mean, he had even said that he didn't really reject Jesus, but he didn't accept him for who he truly was. Yes. Isn't that the lie? You absolutely right? Yeah. And yet Jesus knew that he didn't need an argument. He didn't need another intellectual point of view. He needed to encounter Jesus, and that's mm -hmm. how Jesus met him. <laughs> I really believe that this is speaking to someone right now, and I want to get something into your hands as well. It doesn't cost you anything. It's absolutely free, one 855 let us just unmask the whole New Age thing, but I believe that you've been tampering with some stuff, and it's got you scared, and that's why you're listening to us right now. I want to lead you in a very simple prayer. This prayer is the beginning. It's the gate way into power. Jesus literally said that there is a power in us that's greater because he said, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. But now is the time. Pray this prayer with me. Jesus, I surrender. I call upon your name. I confess my sin. Come into my heart. Make me the person you want me to be. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Wow, I really believe somebody today. Call the number on the screen, 1-855-759-0700. Prayer partners are standing by. Today, you're going to see the real power of God. Give us a call. Up next, we'll return with In Focus and what happens when the youth outgrow the youth groups. Mm -hmm. Well, welcome to In Focus. Today, we're looking at identity formation in today's young adults. And why is this important? Well, because identity formation leads to adulthood. And this is usually where many are choosing to walk away from their faith. Joining me is Rick Heemstra from the Evangelical Fellowship of Canada, who has done extensive research on this also important stage of life called emerging adulthood. Welcome, Rick. It's great to have you on the program with us. I was very interested in your research, not only from someone who's worked with youth, been a pastor, but also I have three emerging adults, okay? <laughs> so I'm looking for answers today. Um, tell us a little bit um, in your study and this incredible, like, years of work, like, why, uh, what is emerging adulthood, first of all? So emerging adulthood is uh, a period before people form their identities, and identities are formed when people negotiate roles in communities, and this is very important. The very big plank in their identity formation that people are looking for is career. And that's become harder and harder for people to target as they need more education, as they try to figure out what they're going to do. Right. And I find even having kids in the 20s, right, it's harder for kids to move into, like you say, careers or jobs, hard for them to launch, so to speak, right? And that's what this study really unpacks. So, yeah, so this study looks at that. And one of the, the other pieces of identity formation is faith formation. And what we found was that when people start to put the big pieces in, in place, like their career, um, their family, that kinds of thing, all the other things start to go into place very quickly. And, and their faith is one of those things. Right. And you know, I'm sure there's people watching too that they're either experiencing this or wondering how to navigate this season. And we all want our kids to follow after the Lord, right? And we're seeing many emerging adults wandering from their faith. And that, was that the motivation behind this study? 
Uh, part of it was, yeah, that was part of the motivation. Part of it what we're, we're looking at is how can we help them to stay connected to church and faith across the, this transition? Because what happens is we send a lot of them off to school and when they when we send them off to school, we're actually sending them out of our church communities and they need a church community to be a part of because if you're going to negotiate a Christian identity, you need a Christian community to negotiate a role in. Well, that is a powerful truth, that whole importance of Christian community. Now, tell me a little bit about what kind of Christian communities are we talking about, like youth groups, um, camps, like what does, what does that look like? What's helpful to them? Well, there are a whole number of different Christian communities, but one of the important ones for young adults are obviously, uh, if they're going to school, it'll be Christian campus groups and uh, new churches, because often they're moving and they need to get in involved in new churches. Right. And that can be a real challenge, can it? Yeah, what we found, though, was that churches have a really important role to play. We found that when someone from your home church tried to make a connection for you, you were four times more likely to get involved in a Christian campus group and three times more likely to get involved in a new church. That is amazing. Like, just hearing that, knowing that we have a responsibility within our churches to our young adults as they, to make connections as they move out of the house, out of the church, into another community, right. right? And you found that that really helps them keep in the way of following Christ? It's, it's huge because they're going to follow Christ if, but they're more likely to follow Christ if they're part of a Christian community. And, when, and I noticed that um, in the study when I was reading it, the role of even camps was interesting. Because sometimes I think we think there's a disconnect from the camp or the youth group, but you, it's all about mentorship, isn't it? And having those extended relationships. Yeah, so mentorship does uh, four things, I would say. So the first thing the mentors do is they come alongside someone and they help them to understand what they're good at. Because lots of young adults, um, they'll say, I don't know what I'm good at. Well, they really do, but what they're looking for is where can I be successful in negotiating a role for myself? Right. Second thing. Can I just say too that I, in working with youth, Encouraging kids and helping them know what they're good at is really important, isn't it? It is. But giving them a place to use their gifts is as important. Yes. It, right? It, absolutely. Yeah. Second thing is that mentors reintroduce the, the young adult to the society of adults. Mm -hmm. This is really important. If young adults have the same role in the church when they're 20 as they did when they were 14, then they're going to leave the church. Wow, that's a real challenge for those of us in the church to make sure not only we encouraging and calling out their giftedness, but giving them an opportunity and a role to play, right? Yeah. Tell me more about the role of mentorship, how we can do that better. Well, one of the things is you can reintroduce them by very simple things like, uh, Joanna's good at this. Have you thought about asking Joanna if, if, they, if she can help with this? Right. Um, Another thing that you can do is come alongside them as they renegotiate those roles, uh, be a negotiation aid. Sometimes things don't go smoothly in a church and you have to help them understand what just happened and help them to get back in. And, and the final thing that mentors are is continuity. Because we do such great work with youth groups, but then we come along at age 18 and we tell them, no, you have to leave now. We actually kick them out of the church. We kick them out of that place wow. where they have a role. Yeah. And so mentors- Unfortunately, I've seen that. Yeah, so yeah. mentors help them have that continuity in the church. You know, that is such a powerful word for our time. The role of mentorship, it is deeply biblical. And we know that God works in community. And if we want our young adults to follow Christ, right, and have the consistency in their life, then we need to step up and be mentors, not only those who speak into the uh, young adult's life, but giving them an opportunity to use their gifts and be a part of the adult community. Have I hit it on the head? Yeah. Well, I'm gonna go home and put it into practice, so I encourage you that at your churches and your community, that we together help our young adults renegotiate their faith in this generation. God bless America. All the politicians say it. Do they know what they're talking about? Scott, in order to have a blessing, you've got to be blessable. You know, I was reading today about a king, and the prophet said to him, it isn't because your father had a nice palace of cedar. The kingdom was blessed. It was because he dealt with the poor and the needy, and he pled the, the cause of the unfortunate. That's what I think God is asking for us to do, is to be obedient, to look after those less fortunate. Get Pat Robertson's latest teaching, Miraculous Blessings, available now.
You may have seen actress Megan Good in Jumping the Broom, Think Like a Man, or on the arm of her husband, pastor and producer Devon Franklin, who just recently celebrated the release of Miracles from Heaven. I'm really excited because uh, it's, it's out and... Uh, it's incredible. It's yeah. so, so good. And I'm not just saying because he's my husband, like, it's so well, good. You can say it for that reason, too. That's cool. Well, I mean, you know, <laughs> I acknowledge it for that reason, but I'm saying it, like, yeah. you know, it's pretty darn good. Devon and Megan met during the filming of Jumping the Broom back in 2011. Not long after that, the two started dating. As the months passed, it became clear that something was different about this Hollywood couple, and everyone wanted to know why. People would come up to us and ask, well, how did you get to know each other and what was going on? Then the truth came out. Devon and Megan were waiting until marriage to have sex. As expected, their decision created quite the buzz in Hollywood. But to the couple's surprise, many were intrigued by the idea of abstinence. As we started telling our story, more people were interested and people began to really want to get real information that could help them in their love life. What I found is a lot of people, not just in the world, but or that are here in Hollywood as well, that are practicing it, that would never talk about it. They're too embarrassed. They feel they'll be shamed or that they're old school. Devon had made the decision in his early 20s when he began serving as a pastor. I wanted to be the same person that could get up and preach and the same person that would go home at night. Didn't want to be a liar, didn't want to be a hypocrite. He also recognized the ideas that premarital sex was acceptable and even beneficial were based on a lie. It's just the mere presentation of doubt that maybe it's actually not as bad for you as you think, or maybe it's actually better for you than you think. And that is where the lie comes in, that we don't need to follow God's plan, that there is a better plan out there, an easier plan, and a plan that'll make you happier. Mm -hmm. And the truth is, there isn't a better plan. God's plan is the best plan, and it does require sacrifice, and it does require obedience, and it's not always easy, but it is deeply rewarding. Megan, on the other hand, bought into those lies at 19, she started making compromises, hoping to hold on to love. She discovered years later that it did more harm than good. You give a piece of yourself away. You lose confidence in the essence of who you were created to be to begin with. And so as you go from relationship to relationship, you know, or, or if you are being promiscuous throughout those years, it, it damages you. Those decisions also affected her relationship with Devon. When we first got together, I had so much baggage and so much damage and so much pain. We had to unpack it, and it was difficult. You know, it was a lot of um, even pre-engagement counseling where we literally just talked and, you know, we found that I had this deep-rooted kind of like, just this feeling of like, I'll never be enough for somebody, no matter what I do, no matter how hard I try. And it took a long time for us to really get to a place where we got past that. After 13 months of dating without sex, Devon and Megan tied the knot in June 2012. Now coming up on their four-year anniversary, they're convinced that their decision to honor each other and God has strengthened their marriage. I've never been in a relationship before where I have so much trust. It's just given you know, us a whole lot more peace, a lot more understanding. Honoring God in this area, He has blessed every other area because when you present your body as a living sacrifice, He honors that. In their new book called The Wait, the couple share their story to encourage others that a strong marriage is worth waiting for. Because practicing it had benefited our lives in such an incredible way, we felt like we wanted to share it so we could help somebody in their life. Our goal is not to be preachy or be judgmental or tell people how to live their lives. It's to say, you know, this is what we did and it changed everything. Megan and Devon, you know, I, I just give them props and big high five. I have appreciated uh, Megan's career, but also uh, Devon. You know, what a wonderful testimony of a person that believes that love waits. You know, if it's truly love, you don't have to test it out. You don't have to put it through the ringer. And so many times we're living in a life that is such a lie. I wonder if you're single right now and you're wondering where Mr. Right is and where Miss Right is. Well, you just pray right there where you are. The Bible says something in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 8. It says, love never 
fails. It never fails to find you. It never fails to bring you into its fullness because we love God because he first loved us. I'm going to challenge you today to do it God's way, to trust God for his perfect will for your life. Because if you'll do that, I believe there's a supernatural miracle waiting on you. You might need some help with that. Call the number on the screen, 1-855-759-0700. But I'm going to pray a pastoral prayer for you right now. And if you believe that you really are to be married, why don't you just stretch out your hands right now? Father, in the name of Jesus, I'm asking for a love revolution to flood these airwaves, and I'm asking for that man and that woman, Lord, where they haven't been able to find that love, I'm asking that as they wait for your perfect will, that you would now bring a witness and a confirmation that they are to be married. Do it now for your namesake, in Jesus' name, amen. Hey, call the number on the screen. Say, Pastor me, I, Pastor B, I received that. And don't go away. We'll be right back to pray with you and for you. Now there are more ways to connect with the 700 Club Canada online. Like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash 700 Club Canada. Find us on Instagram at 700 Club Canada. Or follow us on Twitter at 700 Club Canada. Just email cba at 700club.ca or visit us at 700club.ca. Well, it's been a great show, right, Brian? It I really so has been. appreciate spending time with Rick and all the work and research they've done on mm -hmm. emerging uh, young adults. And, and it just really uh, resonated with me, and maybe this for some of the viewers that you have young adults in your life that you are just been praying for, that you want them to follow Christ, you want them to stay the course. I hope that you really heard today the importance of mentorship and community and that you would walk with young adults in that season. Absolutely. You know, as a teacher, you know all about that as far as the stages that our youth go through. And they are, according to the Word of God, a heritage. Psalms 127 and 3. So we want to pray today for children. Would you put on your prayer request, Ida? She's praying for her children that they would have freedom from depression. And we're also praying for a friend in Saskatchewan who is praying that their husband would uh, know the perfect will for his life. Let's, let's agree. Father, for Ida and also for our children, we recognize they're living in a complicated time, but we're praying for your hedge of protection, your blood to come upon them. God, please be their mm. help now in Jesus' name. Mm. Yes, Lord, we lift up this friend and her husband. We pray for salvation, for repentance, for healing and freedom in his life. And I just lift up our churches and our communities that we would also stand with and walk with our young adults so they may be able to get through these seasons of following you and be faithful to following you in their life in Jesus name. Amen. Hey, we want to say thank you for joining us. And until next time, we will see you again. Keep praying for your children. Have a great day.